Hi, everyone. Welcome to OSF 101, another one of our iterations of OSF 101. These are monthly live trainings where we're helping out and trying to get you onboarded to the OSF. My name is Daniel Steger. I am a technical community manager here at the Center for Open Science. Uh, the Center for Open Science is a nonprofit here in Charlottesville, Virginia, where we try and promote open and transparent practices and research. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is we provide a tool called the Open Science Framework, or the OSF. Uh, this webinar is actually a onboarding to that particular tool. We're going to go and we're going to talk about all of the fun things that the OSF does uh, throughout the research life cycle to support uh, researchers. Now, as we get going, uh, one thing that I want to talk about quick is I want to get to know you. So first thing we're going to do is an audience poll. I want to know your familiarity with the OSF. I want to know if you do have an account. Uh, so Amanda has popped up a poll that will show up on your end. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of see a little bit more about my audience. Uh, do you have an OSF account? Are you familiar with the OSF? So we have a few people who, more people that are slightly familiar, moderately familiar. So we're kind of in that middle range looking to learn. It's awesome. Fair amount of you do have OSF accounts, but a fair amount of you don't, which is also fine. We'll walk through those processes today. Wonderful. Okay, we're about 87% participation. Take your time, answer where you can. Um, but I'm going to get going. So we're going to cover a lot of different topics today. Um, the point of this webinar is really, it is a hands-on webinar. Um, <laughs> popped up again, awesome. Uh, it is a hands-on webinar, but I'm going to be moving pretty quick. Uh, so part of this is that it's going to be recorded. We're going to be taking some of the information and clips from these recordings and putting them on our support guides. Uh, but we're also really going to be trying to make sure that you have the tools that you need to be onboarded. So uh, one thing that I do want to note is that a fair amount of the product team for the OSF, uh, experts in every aspect of what we do, uh, they are in the chat. So if you do have a question, make sure that you do ask that question either in the Q&A or in the chat section, uh, and our team will try and respond to you. Um, I'm going to be covering a little bit more detail uh, than the previous two iterations of this uh, particular webinar, mostly because, again, we're trying to create content. But um, I can't guarantee that there'll be a ton of time at the end of this webinar. Uh, but if we do have that time, I will make sure that we are able to answer your questions. Uh, one of the things that I do want to show you guys is this hands-on notes document. I'm going to have either someone on the team, or I can do this here. Uh, I'm going to post this in the chat here. Uh, this is an excellent resource. So I'm going to show you here. Uh, this is an excellent resource. So that it's basically an outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be talking about all these different things, but it actually has all the links and things that we're going to be talking about. So uh, make sure that you save this resource. Uh, it gives you a great overview of everything that's going to be talked about today, but it's also can be used for later and it pairs well with the recording that's going to be coming out. Wonderful. Um, again, today is going to be a little bit of a hands-on demo. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between both a presentation and uh, a live demonstration of the OSF. So if you do get confused and you have questions, make sure that you're putting those into the chat. Uh, so again, we're going to be talking about some of these basic elements of the OSF. We're going to be talking about your account, how to create an account and look at your profile. Uh, you're going to be looking at how to discover resources. So how to use our OSF search tool. Uh, you're also going to be looking, learning a little bit about registrations, pre-registrations, and how do you plan your research. We're also going to be looking at collaboration tools, uh, one of our more flexible tools, the OSF projects. We're going to walk through you, um, how to create one of those in detail and really how to leverage that tool for your research needs. Uh, and then finally, we're going to be talking a little bit about preprints. Uh, we're going to be talking about OSF preprints and some of our preprint repositories uh, and how that can be used to share your work quickly and transparently um, while connecting to you know, some of your other peer review publications. Finally, we're going to be looking, and this is going to be kind of talked about throughout, uh, the relationships between these. A uh, theme that's going to be coming up in this talk is creating highways, pathways between your work. So how does your data collection phase connect with the rest of your publications, with your planning phases, with your analyses and your pre-registrations? Um, all those things should connect and 
By doing that, you're giving the best chance for your audience to find your work. So let's start from the top. What is the OSF? So the OSF is a free open source research platform that's designed to support researchers throughout the entire research life cycle. So this is a very common graphic that we use, um, which basically just lays out those common steps that you would go through if you were a researcher and you're conducting a research study. Uh, we're trying to design tools that make sure that we can support open and transparent practices at each one of these phases instead of just you know targeting one specific phase. Um, so whether you are trying to search and discover or you're uh, locking in an idea or you're analyzing your data, or you're publishing your reports and your manuscripts, uh, we try and offer tools that can help you out, especially if you're going to be sharing that openly and transparently with your community. So let's start off creating an account and a profile. Uh, a fair amount of you do have OSF accounts, but I'm gonna walk through some of the steps in order to create an OSF account. Uh, and I'll walk you through what our profiles look like. So to start, this is if you just type in osf.io, um, that's all the way up here in this top banner. Uh, this is gonna take you to your main page here. Uh, this is going to take you to your main OSF homepage. Now, in order to sign in, you're going to be looking up here in the top right hand corner. You're going to see a sign in button versus a sign up button. If you already have an account, obviously you would be signing in. And I'll show you some of the different ways that you can do that. Uh, but you can also sign up using these different methods. Uh, I'm going to start by clicking sign up in that green button. I actually already have an OSF account, surprisingly, saying that I work here. Uh, but there are three different methods for doing this. Uh, I highly suggest if you don't have an OSF account, uh, I would start with kind of more of a streamlined method, um, our basic method of signing in. Um, so all that would require is your name, your contact email, and a password. Um, Agree to our terms of service, make sure that you do review those before you get started. Uh, and then check that if you are a robot. And if you are a robot, I am on your side. A little bit of humor. Uh, anyways, uh, that's pretty much the most streamlined way of signing up for the OSF. Uh, but there are other methods of signing up for the OSF. Uh, and these are also ways that you can sign in. Uh, these use external verification methods, uh, basically remilly methods, uh, in order to verify who you are, your login method, uh, and how you can come back. First one I'm going to talk about is your ORCID ID. Now, for those of you that are not familiar, uh, ORCID IDs are persistent identifiers for people. Um, they're essentially a code of numbers that relate to you personally as a researcher. Those are your codes. It's almost like a barcode for a person. Uh, you're able to take all those resources, so all of your publications, all of your data, and all your things, you can connect that back to one code. Uh, they're really great, and especially if you're submitting for grants or any sort of publications, anything like that to show your history. Uh, this is a great way to kind of link back to those methods. So Say I'm going to use ORCID uh, to log in. I'm going to start by clicking the ORCID ID button. And this is actually going to take me to the ORCID website. As I said, this is kind of a relay method. Um, as you can see, I do have an ORCID account, but I can create one of those through their different methods. Uh, you know, sign in through Google, Facebook, whatever. Um, I just use my email and a password. Um, but if I'm able to sign in through this, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to authenticate me through ORCID and it's going to send me actually back to the OSF. Uh, I am actually going to go back to our page on the OSF. I'm going to show you the other method before I sign in through ORCID. Um, now, going back to the sign up, uh, we also have institutions. Now, a little bit misleading. Um, this actually means OSF institutions. Uh, our institutions are paid partners. Uh, these are groups and universities and institutions around the world who have signed an agreement to work with us. Uh, they basically, uh, they're trying to aggregate all of the work for all of their resource members, all of their researchers in their universities or institutions. They kind of aggregate all of that work together. Uh, but that's a paid service to, that our team can definitely show you more information about in the chat if you're interested. But uh, one of the benefits of that is that anybody from those institutions can sign in through those institutions. Um, so one of the ways that I can do is if I am a member of one of these institutions, I'm going to click on that institution button, 
and I can find my institution on here. Now, this is a great way of telling if uh, your particular institution is a member of OSF institutions, uh, but you can scroll through this list and see if your group is on here. If it's not, um, then feel free to reach out to us. Maybe we can set something up for you and your team and we can talk through what that looks like. I am actually an alumni of one of these OSF institutions, uh, Virginia Tech. So I'll show you kind of what that looks like on the other end. So I'm going to click on Virginia Tech and I'm going to sign in through Virginia Tech. Now, this is actually taking me to the VT uh, login portal. So it's taking me to their site in order to authorize uh, my username, my password, and then I can connect that back to the OSF. Now, I played around with this a little bit this morning, and I'm actually going to go with my ORCID ID here. And I'm going to sign in. And one thing that's going to pop up for me, because I've already created my account, is a two-factor verification. Now, I highly suggest that you do this type of security with your work, um, mostly because uh, two-factor verifications, uh, they, they make sure that you have extra security when it comes to your stuff. Uh, it only takes one person to log in when they're not authorized. Um, but this sends a code basically to your phone um, through an authentic authenticator app. Uh, and it's really important to make sure that you do have those options. So right now I'm looking at my phone, I am putting in my code, and I'm able to log in. As you can see, we are doing the getting started banner right at the top. So now that we have logged in, we know how to log in, let's check out what our profiles look like. The first thing that you're gonna to wanna to do in order to go to your profile is you're gonna look up here in the top uh, right-hand corner, you're gonna see your name. Uh, next to it, you're gonna see a little drop-down arrow. I'm going to click on that drop-down arrow and I'm going to look at my profile. I'm going to click on my profile and this is gonna take you to your public profile page. Now, all these profile pages are roughly structured exactly the same way. Um, what you're going to see is any of your public projects or public components. These are tools on the OSF, and we're going to talk about them a little bit in a bit. Um, but only things that are public will be shown on this page. Uh, you will also see your public profile link. So if you want to share this public profile link with another group or another person, all you need to do is send them this particular link, and this it directly relates only to you. An important aspect of these profile pages are the social entertainment education features where you're filling out information about yourself. Uh, as you can see, I logged in through ORCID. Uh, so my ORCID ID is actually connected right here. Uh, but say I logged in through my email address. Um, once you log in through ORCID once, it's going to show up on here. Um, but other than that, you can actually edit your profile information to put in any sort of information. All you would do to do that is look up in this top left-hand corner. You're going to see edit your profile. Click on this link. Not sure why it keeps doing that. Uh, and it's going to take me to my settings page. Now, important thing to realize is this side column here where you have all these different tabs. But the first thing I'm going to look at is my profile information. This is where I can change my name. Uh, so say I get married and I have to rename myself. Um, I can change that information here. And that directly relates to uh, all my citations. So make sure that you are looking at the different citation styles and how that looks and how that comes out, um, because that's very important, especially as people are citing your work on the OSF. Looking at account settings, which is that second tab down on the side, uh, I can add a additional email addresses. So as you'll see, I have an email address for my primary email, which is the OSF, which is the one that I log in through. Uh, however, I do have alternate email addresses. This is my Virginia Tech email address. I do have the option over here of making that my primary email address. Now, why am I telling you this? Uh, people change jobs. People get new email addresses all the time. Uh, and what you can do is before you lose access to those email addresses, all you need to do is add your email address and change it to whatever your primary. So if you say move uh, to a different university or institution, this gives you an excellent opportunity to maintain all of your work and still have login access to your work. Um, if something happens and you're not able to connect your email address, that's fine. Uh, all you need to do is email support and we'll walk you through the process of how to uh, connect and merge any accounts that you create. Uh, default storage location is something we'll talk about when we talk about projects. I'm going to talk about here. 
uh, any connected identities uh, or verified affiliated institutions, again, OSF institutions, not general institutions, uh, opting into sharing, uh, which is our preprint sharing service. Uh, if I wanted to change my password, I can do this here. I can also do that on the main login page as well. Uh, but this is a great way if you wanted to just change it here. Uh, again, one thing I was pointing out is the security settings. If you want to disable or you want to enable two-factor, this is how you're going to do it. The last thing I want to talk about is deactivating accounts. Uh, that's down at the bottom of this page. Uh, so if you request a deactivation, what's going to happen is that's going to be a different request depending on who you are, how many things you have on the OSF. Um, and realistically, what that's going to do is it's going to send the request to our support team. Our support team is going to look at your profile, look at all your information, and tell you exactly what's going to happen when you deactivate your account. Sometimes that looks different depending on what uh, tools and things you have created on the OSF. Uh, they're going to ask you to confirm whether that's what you want to do or not. And then from there, we can actually deactivate your account. OK, so with that, I'm going to go back to OSF Home. I'm going to go back to my slides. And we're going to talk about searching. So searching, uh, when you are looking at the OSF, and you're trying to create your first project, you're on the first stage of your, your research life cycle, uh, you want to evaluate what's out there. The OSF has thousands and thousands and thousands of preprint publications. They have registered studies and plans and data and uh, analyses and all these things that researchers have been contributing and putting onto this amazing platform. But how do you find it? How do you discover it? So uh, this is a, you are here. Uh, on the map of the OSF. So what I'm going to do in order to do that, I'm going to go to osf.io, obviously. Um, and you really don't even have to be logged in for this, but it does help. Uh, I'm going to look at search at the top bar here. Uh, search is one of the second tabs over. And if I click on that, it's going to take me to my search tab. Now, this is a new page that we have completely refined um, over the past year or so uh, in order to give more access to what we're doing. There's a couple of things that I really want to show you here. Um, along the side column, you'll see filters. Um, these will filter based on creator, date created, funder, um, subject license, and they do vary depending on these other filters that are along the top. Now, these other filters that are along the top, it's important to note that these are tools on the OSF. So projects doesn't refer to just general projects out in the world has just generally defined. These are OSF projects. Uh, these are registrations, which are either housed here on our registries or in connected registries. Uh, preprints, again, same thing. If they are in a connected preprint service, this is how you can search for those. Uh, files on the OSF, uh, particular users on the OSF. Um, so it's important to make sure that you're looking at the tools along with um, how you want to refine those things. So let's test it out. Uh, first thing I want to do is I'm going to try and search for projects. We're just going to look at different projects on the OSF here. Uh, first thing I want to do is I'm going to try and look for funder. Now, all of these things that are created along this side column are based on metadata. So when someone is creating a project, a registration preprint, they have the option of offering what is called metadata. That is data about your data, data about your project. It's very high level. Um, and the idea is that it's exactly for this purpose. Um, when I am an outsider, I'm coming to look and learn about what you're doing. I can now look and narrow down how I want to search for your things based on that metadata. So Funder is one of those options. Uh, first thing I'm going to look at here is I'm going to try the... Projects for Fire National Science Foundation. Um, I'm just going to click on the NIH, National Institute of Health. Now, that actually took me down to 20 results. There's only been 20 people on the OSF who have uh, created that particular filter um, who are funded by the NIH. I know there's more than that in the world, but this gives an opportunity for those 20 people to show up on someone's search a lot faster. Uh, and then what I can do is just pick one of these things. Uh, that metadata is going to take me to one of these OSF projects. And say I go up here, that metadata tab, we'll talk about projects more in a second. Um, this will actually show me some of the links and information about that, that project. So here uh, you have a description of what that project is, quick overview. Uh, you have the contributors that I could have found based on searching. Uh, resource type, 
They actually didn't list any resource type here, uh, but it could be uh, a data analysis plan, or it could be you know, a particular file, or you know, any sort of those things. And there's a drop down menu that you can choose from. But it does help you refine those things. Uh, they didn't list that this is in English. Obviously, I can tell that it's in English. But if someone, say, searched for only resources in English, uh, this one might not come up, unfortunately, even if it is in English. Uh, they listed what the funder is and the award title and the award information. All of those things are valuable for someone who's trying to verify your work. Um, when you click on a link, it'll create a new tab. So I'm actually going to go back to my original tab here. That was fun. Let's start and we'll try and go back to the beginning. So say I don't like that particular search. Uh, in order to go back, I'm going to look here at the funder thing that I've created. So one of the criteria that I created. And if I wanted to get rid of that, all I'm going to do is click that X that is next to that button. That takes that search criteria and removes it from my thing. So now I only search criteria is projects. I'm actually going to look for registrations at this point. I click a different tab. So now my one search criteria is registrations. I'm going to then go to subject. This is a subject that they have classified themselves as. And I'm going to click psychology, which will give me you know, 34,000 results. All right. I want to narrow it down more than 35 or 34,000 results. Uh, I'm going to click clinical psychology, which will give me about you know, 3,000 results. Okay. So now my search results are compounding. I have psychology, clinical psychology, registration. Um, I'm going to talk, type in something now. Autism. Now I'm down to 129. Um, I've now refined it based on registration, psychology, clinical psychology, and a search term. Okay, this is fantastic because now I have a very refined list that I can kind of work from. But what if I want to share this list with, say, a PI, a friend, a colleague? I can take this, all these you know, search criteria are then found up here in my URL. So if I can take that, copy, paste it, I can now send it in the chat to all of you. And you can look at it and find 129 results. Uh, important thing that I also want to note here, I'm going to remove a couple of these search criteria so we can get back at it, is badges. Registrations have uh, open resource badges. Um, again, one of the things I was talking about is you want to create highways between your work. So whether you have data, analytical code, materials, the more that you connect those things to one place, the more opportunities that people have to find your work. So especially open resource badges, if I say clicked on data, and again, I'm an outside person, I have no preference in what I'm picking here. I'm just going based on what's available. Uh, I now know that on this particular registration, this link, I will have access to their data, their analytical code, their materials, their paper, the final publication that came out of this, and some supplementary materials that came out of this. That's really appealing for me if I'm going to be clicking on a link because I don't have to go searching and going through multiple different search sources just to figure out what the data is that's associated with this registration or this uh, analytical code that's associated with this registration. It makes it very appealing for someone from an outsider to find your work. All right, that was fun. I'm going to go back to home and we're going to go on to the next phase of the OSF. You're planning your research, registrations versus pre-registrations, right? Uh, this typically happens in this phase of developing an idea, study idea, uh, study design, and acquiring materials. So first off, what is a registration? Now, the typical you know, trajectory of research is you design a project, you conduct that project, you report on that project, and you publish that project. Uh, the peer review phase happens between the report and publish when you submit to a publisher, somebody reviews it, and decides whether it's worthy of publishing. The problem with that and one of the replication problems is that it tends to lead to only successful studies really working out um, and being published. Uh, it doesn't really add credit to all of the work that happens beforehand. Uh, it also kind of incentivizes people to, you know, if they get a result that doesn't match what their plan was, they could have just they could just change their plan and then suddenly the results match what they planned to do um, in big air quotes. Uh, the metaphor we like to use is it's like if you fired a bow and arrow and wherever that arrow landed, you just drew a target around it. 
and said, yeah, that's totally what I meant to do. That's not really transparency and that's not really how research is supposed to go. Uh, and by doing that, you kind of lose faith in the research process. So registrations are a way of combating that. So talking about pre-registration, a pre-registration or registration is a time-stamped version, a read-only version of your research plan. It's created at a very specific moment in time. And the point is, is that you are basically calling your shot. You are locking in your plan at a certain phase and saying, at this time, at this date, this was my research plan. Here's what my hypothesis is. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to analyze and how it's going to happen. And then at the end, when you are finally publishing, you can share that pre-registration and say, look, back at this date, at this time, this is what my plan was. And see, I actually got the results that I want. Now, the question that we usually get here is what are the difference between registrations and pre-registrations? Um, and that is a little bit ambiguous because sometimes in the world they are used synonymously, but at least on the OSF, this is how we kind of define it. Uh, it's really based on the timing of when you're submitting this registration versus pre-registration. So again, up here at the top, you have design, conduct, report, and publish. That's in general timeline for a research project. Now, for a pre-registration, what you are doing is while you are designing and preparing to conduct that experiment, you're filling out the form. Now, prior to actually conducting that experiment, you submit this form, you submit this pre-registration form that locks it in place. You have a timestamp that says, this is what my plan was at this moment in time prior to conducting this experiment. Now, obviously things change and you can update that form, but every version, it'll create a new version of that pre-registration and every version will tell that story. It's kind of like you know, one of those old timey flip books where you have, you know, one version and then one page and one image and one image and one minute, one minute. And every time you're flipping it, you're getting that full story of what's happening. And that can happen all the way up until you publish. Um, the point is that when you publish, you can call your shot and say, hey, I did this and my idea happened right before we conducted experiments. So no funny business happened. Whereas registrations, they're a little bit more ambiguous on the timeline. Uh, again, you are trying to fill out that form as prior to conducting your experiment, um, but you can actually submit that form really after you've conducted your experiment while you're reporting all the way up until the moment that you actually publish. Um, as you can tell, uh, we, we're not, that's not super transparent and we don't love that idea. We do push people to try and pre-register work as that is probably the more transparent of methods. But the problem is, is that things happen. COVID-19, for example, or, um, you know, things change in your research lab. Uh, you have to make changes. Uh, some, you know, some forms, some disciplines that pre-registration just isn't super practical, um, especially for some of the more applied disciplines. So registering your work is still very important, um, but we do tend to push people towards pre-registrations. The second part of this uh, that I usually get as a question is, the idea of scooping. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, scooping is a term where uh, you have an idea, you share it with somebody you probably shouldn't have, uh, and that person has more resources, more time, more money, uh, and they conduct your experiment before you do, and they get to publishing before you do. Um, obviously, that doesn't work very well in this idea of pre-registration. If I submit this publicly, someone could just take my work uh, and they could publish before me. So obviously we live in the real world. We would love if you shared your work publicly beforehand, you know, you get a timestamp with that, but uh, we do also offer the idea of embargoing. So embargoing is temporarily making a registration private up to four years after you've submitted it. Um, this gives you time in order to, you know, conduct your actual experiment. You've submitted a timestamp, um, but you can conduct your experiment, uh, finish your analyses, get ready to publish, have it submitted for publication, have it published, and then release your registration to the public and say, hey, I called my shot when? And that looks like this. Now, you also may be wondering, what does that look like on the OSF? Um, I'll show you right here. Uh, so here is a example of a registered registration on the OSF that is embargoed. Can anyone see anything? So if someone just randomly finds your link, clicks in you know, random digits, they find your registration, they will see a page that says page not found. This same exact registration on the same exact link 
in a view only version, which you could share with uh, colleagues or people that you trust or uh, grant evaluators, um, you could share a view only link, which edits that URL to give you a private version of that space. Uh, that's the difference between seeing a embargoed registration versus an embargo registration with a view only link. Okay, now let's go back to here. Let's see what some of these registrations actually look like. So explain what a registration looks like can be as simple as this. Uh, so this is an updated version of a registration. Starting here on the side, you will see a little bit of the tabs. Again, you can add metadata to your registration, files, resources, anything like that. Uh, those open resources badges, those links are found here on the side. So if I go to resources, I can see the data that is connected with this um, OSF registration. Along, as you go down the column, you'll see the content that is available for this registration. Uh, you also see the timestamp and the type of registration that this is. This is an OSF pre-registration and it was created on September 20, 23rd, 2020. Uh, you'll see all the contributors that are associated with this registration. Uh, it's important to note that contributors on the registration uh, need to be admin in order to accept that registration. Uh, all registrations that are public are associated, have a DOI, um, that is a digital object identifier, which is a persistent link uh, that will never break and never change. So if you're going to share your work with a publication or a registration, you're going to want to share your DOI. Uh, you can also add a license or citation uh, to make sure that you are telling people how you want your work to be shared. Uh, again, I said that registrations can be updated. Uh, the original version is found here. Uh, and you can see that what the original plan was and, and any additional versions of that registration, you'll see the latest version uh, where they'll give the reason for the update and what sections were actually updated in comparison. Again, looking at that flip book. Now, going to our next version, um, let's take a second and let's look at how can I actually create a registration. Now, the first sec one thing I want to do is go up to this top section and look at add new. I'm going to click and it's going to create, take me to um, the OSF registration draft page. From here, I'll have two options. Uh, do I create a registration from an existing OSF project? So if you've been working really hard on an OSF project and you want to use that to like create a snapshot of that, reg uh, that OSF project, you can absolutely do that. Um, all I would do is click yes. And then I would select what project I want to work from. And that'll pre-fill in a lot of the information from your registration into whatever template you would like to use. The other aspect is if I want to start brand new. So if I want to just start a registration from scratch, I don't have a project I'm working from, I can click no, and I can select what template I would like to use. Now, these templates are all based around trying to give you different criteria and framework in order to frame how you want to plan your study, plan your registration. Um, there are different options, and I can't really tell you which one works best for you. Uh, the team has a chat. Uh, they'll send in the chat a, uh, a link that'll help you essentially decide which one works better for you. Uh, it's our choose your own licensing or choose your own uh, registration template. Uh, and you can look through that. So for now, I'm going to click on OSEP pre-registrations because that's the one I was talking about the most. I'm going to click create a draft. And all that does is it really gives me the option of going through and adding in all of the information. So this is the registration metadata, again, the high level that you want to fill out. Uh, title, description, um, contributors. Now it's important to note here, uh, different permission levels. If you want somebody to be able to approve and you need them to approve this registration before it becomes public, uh, you want to have them be an administrator. Uh, it's also important to note that any associated projects with a registration can have different permission levels. They can have different permission levels. So if you have the same contributors, but it, on your project, one of them is an admin versus on a registration, or one of them is, say, a read and write only, uh, that just makes it so that they can't actually approve this registration. It will go on and be approved even without them. Affiliated institutions, we've talked about that, adding a license. Uh, and this basically just takes you through all of the elements that you need to look at. So study type, uh, uh, whether it's blinded or not, sampling, vari variables, analysis plan, um, everything all the way down to other. Uh, it'll give you a chance to review before I get started. Uh, and as I said, um, 
after you filled out all this information, I can't submit it now because it won't even let me click on this because I don't have some of the information filled out. Uh, it'll give me the two options. First, when I click register, it'll give me the option to embargo. You can pick a date again up to four years from now. Um, but then it'll also send out an email to all of your admin on your project um, asking them to approve. They'll have 48 hours and then it will be auto approved if not. Now, again, I'm running a little bit behind, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to talk about OSF projects. OSF projects are a very flexible tool that can be used essentially throughout the entire research lifecycle. We talk about in your planning, your conducting, your reporting, um, whether you're analyzing your data or you are planning out a hypothesis, OSF projects are a really great way of kind of getting that started. I would describe OSF projects as a really, really great way of creating project management around specific levels of a research initiative. Um, so if you think about how you organize your research projects in your files, your folders, in your own storage providers, you typically have some sort of hierarchy. Uh, top level, you could have you know, your research lab, uh, but then you have you know, a folder for a research initiative, research initiative two, a grant project, something like that. And then inside of that, you have additional folders. Um, this just gives you an opportunity to create a you know, a project management idea for each one of these folders where you can share and coordinate with colleagues, whether you're creating a hypothesis all the way through, um, you know, establishing your protocol. Now, on the OSF, that kind of looks a little bit interesting where we have kind of this parent child structure of um, projects. It's almost like uh, one of those nesting dolls type of ideas where at the top level you have a OSF project where this is the example of your, uh, you know, your project level and major one. Um, but then you have sub projects where on the OSF, those are called components. So here you'll see, you know, main title for the main one. Um, but then I've created components for each one of these sub projects. Um, and that kind of works in that same structure. In each one of these components, you will see a section for hypothesis, data collection, protocols. Um, those components really help you organize your structure. And it also helps you kind of work around um, some storage restrictions as well. Uh, I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to show you a little bit about how, how that works on the OSF. So if I'm going to create an OSF project, the first thing I'm going to do is go to osf.io. I'm going to click on the create new uh, project. Before we get going, I want to talk about our dashboard really quick. Uh, this is a great way for you to quickly look through all of your projects. So I have a ton of projects on the OSF. Um, and if I'm going to look for any of my resources, my things, all I need to do is go to osf.io, look at our dashboard, which you write down, search for what I want based on you know contributors or the title, uh, and it'll pop it up very quickly. So it's a very great way of kind of expediting your work. Anyways, to create a project. You want to start with creating a new OSF project. This is the green button that's here. Click this. Uh, this gives me the opportunity, it's a pop-up window, uh, to show what title I would like. So I'm just going to put uh, test project. Again, these affiliations are associated with OSF institutions. I'm going to remove those. Uh, storage locations. Uh, this is very important, especially if you are in you know, different regions of the world. Uh, we offer four different storage locations. Now, don't look for your particular country. Think about regions and what you're working on. The, re the point of this is to really get around storage restrictions based on region of the world. So like say the EU, they do have uh, how restrictions on how data can be used and stored. One of the important ones that you can do is you could store your work in Germany. Uh, and that will really help you get around some of those storage restrictions. Uh, in our case, I'm just gonna say this is, stored in the United States and click create. I have the option of working here or going to the project. I'm going to go to the project. Awesome. So now uh, this is my test project. Uh, all test projects, when they come in, they are immediately private. Um, I have the option of making this public or private at any time. Um, and again, I can delete this at any time. That's why I'm doing a little bit more of a demo here, but it provides a lot more flexibility than registrations, where registrations, they can only be withdrawn and your metadata still remains, uh, whereas project can be completely deleted and no one will ever know exists. Uh, title up top, all you need to do to change it is click the title uh, and make the edits and click the green button. Uh, for contributors, so contributors on the OSF, this is a great way of kind of collecting all of the people who are associated with your project into one place so that you can all work on something at the same time. 
To add a contributor, all I'm going to do is go up to the top here. I'm going to click on the plus button. And I'm going to search for a person. Now, in this case, I'm going to search for my colleague, Eric Olson, who might not even be here, but that is OK. I'm going to click and add him as a contributor. Now, I have a couple of different options here. Uh, I can add him as a read and write contributor, which basically means he has the right to read and write on this project, but he doesn't really have the right to create. Uh, uh, he it, it kind of restricts some of the different things. Um, I don't really have enough time to get into it. So maybe one of our uh, product people can help and send out some of the differences in the permission levels. And that's something you need to evaluate as well. Um, but uh, I'm going to add him in this case as an administrator. Now, say you are in a situation where you are a lab manager, where you're in, on a ton of different projects, but you're not necessarily on the byline of those projects. You are not on the citation. Um, you can actually remove that person um, from the byline, but they could still participate on the project by clicking this button of bibliographic contributor. I'm going to remove Eric from this and I'm going to click add. Now, this will add him to the project. He is not a bibliographic contributor. So if I go back to the main project here, you will not see him on this contributor line. You will not see him on the citations here. Whereas if I go back and click on contributors again, I add him as a bibliographic contributor, save the changes, click save, go back to my main page. Suddenly Eric is now as a contributor on the byline and he's in the citations, which is fantastic. Another element I want to talk about is file uploads. Uh, the OSF is a storage provider, obviously, um, but one of the ways that you can upload files is really two, there's a few different methods, but I, I tend to prefer the drag and drop method. So on my desktop right now, I have a folder. I'm going to take this folder and I can drag it and put it directly onto the OSF storage folder. Or I can go to the files page, which is located up here at the top, take that document and bring it all the way over here and also drag it and drop it in. Um, I'm going to go back to the main page and I'm going to drag and drop this in, which is awesome. Now, all files on the OSF have the ability to be versioned. So now if I am, say, on my document as that uploads, I can make a change as you guys are looking at my thing. I can make a change to this, to this document. And I'm going to click out, make sure that that's saved. Yep. And I can upload it using the same title to this OSF project. Great news is, is that that now created only one version of that file that will pop up here. And you will see that version render here as the latest version. But if I go over here to the top right hand corner, I can look at versions, revisions, and I can see the original. Come on. And then the new version. Uh, this is excellent for, especially for those who love to send emails back and forth saying, hey, here's the latest version of this manuscript. And then suddenly you're losing track of what that latest version is. If you keep the same title and you just make changes, you can see every single revision that happens. Uh, next thing I want to talk about really quick is I want to talk about adding metadata. Again, metadata is key for having people find your work and connecting your work. Uh, this is very similar to the registration metadata. You can add whatever resource type you would like. So say this is a book, a chapter, a data set, an event. Um, you can make any sort of those changes and log that in here. Uh, this will be obviously in English. I can make those changes. Um, and I can also add a description. Those are all things that people see when they're searching the OSF that'll help them find you quicker. Again, uh, privacy settings, uh, you can make this public and private at any time. Um, if I say am a private document, all to share a private version of my uh, project with someone else, all I would do is click contributor. Say they are not a contributor and I don't want to add them to the byline of this project. All I would do is go to view only links. That is the same process for registrations. Um, if I click here, click add, I have the option of anonymizing the template for our project and also sending out a version of this. This will create a URL for my private project that is anonymous. I'm gonna copy this here. And one time I'm just gonna pop it in here. I can also send it to all of you. 
here, where you'll see an anonymous version. So all the contributors on this are anonymous. Um, now, note that this doesn't anonymize any of the files that are associated with work, but it does help you share your work with funders or um, anyone that needs to peer review your work that does not need to see who actually is the person who's running your project. One thing quickly I want to talk about is add-ons. Um, so we know that there are so many different tools out there uh, that come to research. Um, so we have citation add-ons, um, storage add-ons, um, and the idea being that you can connect any of these different tools that you use, so say Big Share, GitHub, uh, Google Drive, and you can connect them to your OSF project. So to give you an example, I'm going to go to Google Drive and I'm going to enable that connection. Now it's very important that you go through and read how this actually works on the OSF and what that two-way connection actually looks like. So I'm going to confirm it. This will create a successfully changed and it will create a pop-up down here at the bottom where I can configure my add-on. I'm going to import from my uh, Google account. Click import. And this will give me basically a rendering of all of my different files that are on my Google Drive account. I'm going to click the test one because that's the one I've set up for this. And I'm going to click save. You will see a little link down here that says successful. The file has been added to your content. I'm going to go back to my main homepage here. And down here at the bottom where that file tree was, um, you will see you know, the original document that we uploaded to the OSF storage versus the Google Drive storage. Now, one beautiful thing that I want you all to remember is that anything that is stored outside of the OSF, so say I connect it to a Google Drive, an Amazon S3, anything like that, that does not go against your storage restrictions on an OSF project. Uh, on an OSF project, if it is private, it is five gigabytes. You have five gigabytes max to put on one of these OSF projects. Um, but if it is public, you have 50. But anything that's stored on your you know, Google Drive or external storage provider, that doesn't go against that limit which is really a great way of kind of working around that system. Um, additionally, every component that you create will have its own five gigabyte, 50 gigabyte storage limit. So you can, in theory, have more and more and more. Uh, now, uh, one other thing that I really want to point out, a um, couple more, uh, recent activity. If you're an admin, you have access to seeing all of the changes that happen. So you can look back here and see them when I added the COVID document, I uh, added the different tests, I connected my Google Drive. Um, you could see the timestamp version of all those things. Now, it's not the same as registration, but it does show the recent activity and helps someone, say, at a PI level, coordinate with everyone else and see what's going on. Another aspect I really want to point out here is your wikis. Uh, your wiki is basically a blank template for you to do anything you want. Uh, it is a text box. You, I've seen people use it to coordinate between team members. I've seen people use it as a syllabus if they're using an OSF project to run their course, or I've seen lab managers use it as a way of ordering products. Um, it's essentially a way of just coordinating with your team members. And it's also versioned. So you can see all those different changes as well. Make sure to add a description, a license to share how you want people to use your work. Um, and again, if you wanted to add, say, those sub projects, those components, you're going to be looking here at add component or linking an existing project. And the process will be essentially the same um, as creating a project. I can add the contributors from my current project. Um, and I can also add the tags, but every one of those uh, sub components will link back to this main component and it'll be found here. Now, running a little short on time, which is fine, uh, but we're gonna be moving on to preprints. Uh, preprints are pre-publications. Uh, the idea with preprints is that if you say, aren't able to get your work published in a peer reviewed journal or you wanna get your work out quickly, um, preprints are an excellent way of doing that. Make sure that you're checking with your peer reviewed journal that you're targeting, make sure that they allow for preprint, but a fair amount of them do, most of them do actually. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to go to home and I'm going to do this drop down button and we can take a look at what preprints look like. Um, now, again, preprints are submitting a manuscript version of your project. Um, in order to submit a preprint, I have a couple of different options. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I can either submit here with this green button, so submit a preprint, pretty obviously, or I can go up here at that top button of add a preprint. Take you to the same link. 
Uh, now, this will give you kind of a similar process as you would see with a registration, where it'll give you a series of options in order to submit. Here we have services. Um, on the OSF, we have a ton of different uh, partners that we work with that are all discipline specific. So say you are a African researcher and you want to submit your work to um, a preprint service for African researchers, please use uh, African Archive. Um, but do check out some of these different uh, services as they kind of clientele uh, what audiences you're looking for. Uh, for files, you wanna make sure uh, you are saving and continuing. Um, upload a file from your computer. Um, in this case, I would just upload the COVID-19 documents, um, author assertions. Again, it doesn't like it if you don't actually fill out the full form, which is unfortunate. Um, author assertions, come on now. You're just gonna make me do this? Okay. Regardless, um, save and continue, let me continue onward. Uh, author assertions. So do I have public data available? This is uh, your ability to connect to an external source where you're storing your data. Again, creating those highways are highly important. Do you have a pre-registration? Did you pre-register on the OSF and you want to connect that to your preprint? This is how you're going to do it. Uh, take that link, make sure that you're posting into here and what that plan is. Uh, your basics, uh, you want to make sure that you label who the copyright holder is or who will be contacted if someone has questions about the copyright. Uh, did you already submit a peer-reviewed version of this? Is it already published? If that's the case, what you can do is you can take that DOI that was created and link it here. Uh, that gives the opportunity for anybody that finds your preprint to find the peer-reviewed publication version. Uh, adding keywords are a great way of making sure people find you in searches. Uh, adding an abstract helps them figure out what you're doing. Uh, disciplines, again, those are those filters that people are searching through when we were talking about in the beginning. Uh, authors, making sure that you are putting all the authors that are associated with your preprint on this service, uh, conflict of interest, any supplementary materials. Again, connecting an OSF project is a great way of doing that for your preprints. Now, um, this, uh, because I'm submitting African Archive, they have different moderated services. Uh, Pre-moderation means that uh, you will submit, it will be private, moderators will review it, and then they will release it when it becomes public. Um, uh, post moderation means that it'll immediately become public and then moderators will look at it and decide whether they want to keep it on their service. And all I would do from there is click this green button down the bottom that says submit preprint. Now, you've gone through the full process. You've submitted a preprint. Let's talk about relationships. All of those things that you have created, those DOIs that are available on anything that's public on the OSF. So a public project, a public Preprint, a public registration, those all can be equipped with DOIs or digital object identifiers. Those DOIs can be connected to essentially anything that you do. Um, using data site and ROAR, we can connect it back to that ORCID ID, that barcode that is specifically meant for you. Um, and it connects all of your work. The more that you are connecting and building those badges, those uh, all those different ways that I've highlighted today, those are all opportunities for others to find one bit of your work and connect it to the rest of that story. It's like the binding of a book. You're able to connect all of those chapters together. And it's very important to do on the OSF. And we have a couple of different tips and help guides to help you out. Okay, I went super duper fast. Um, I didn't leave a ton of time for questions. Uh, we do have a ton of resources that can help you. Um, so we are obviously creating these video resources um, and this will be edited and chopped up and made sure that it is in the most accessible format for everyone. Uh, we have an OSF support center where we have over 200 help guides that can help you figure out exactly what you need to do on the OSF. And we're constantly updating and giving all the tender love and care to that support center. Uh, we offer monthly tips and tricks uh, for new and innovative ways of using the OSF and highlighting case studies. Um, if you have any questions, please contact our support center, support at osf.io, and you reach probably one of our product members um, who can actually help you with your specific question. Uh, again, we're going to be hosting these webinars and events uh, that'll help highlight different case studies and different ways of using the OSF. Um, but you can also, um, if you have more questions, please reach out to us. Now, I've talked a about a couple of different fee-for-service things, either uh, 
preprint services or OSF institutions, and you saw some of the benefits of those. But if you were interested in learning a little bit more about those, please feel free to reach out to our team. We're really helpful. Um, and we'd love to talk to you about some of those ideas. Uh, additionally, training is one of those things that we offer. If you want to have a training for your group, your institution, your um, whoever you want to host, uh, please reach out to us because that is a service that we also offer. I may have missed this in the beginning, but the OSF is a tool designed for researchers by researchers. So please reach out to us with feature requests, creative ways of uh, using the OSF. Um, anything that you can provide to us is extremely, extremely valuable. Before we go, um, Amanda is gonna send out a closing poll. Please take a second and review this. Um, we try and create new and new innovative ways of doing these webinars. Um, all of these things will really, really help us in future versions of uh, both this webinar and anything else that I can do uh, to support you. So I'm gonna remove this poll from here because I don't wanna bias any results. Um, we have a few minutes. I'm going to stop sharing here. And if anybody has any questions, um, I'm happy to answer maybe one if we have time. Um, but I do appreciate everyone coming here and learning a little bit more about the OSF. I'm seeing a ton of thank yous, which is always great to hear. I, I appreciate that deeply. I do feel like I was moving a little quick through that presentation, but if anyone has any questions, please reach out to our team. Um, we're always happy to help and happy to learn more about how you're using the OSF. Go ahead, Mark. One of the panelists is raising their hand. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. So um, let's say that we did go through a lot of things and they want to be able to review the content again because maybe they forgot something or missed something. Where can they find that? Yes, uh, we are going to be making this recording available. Um, and again, we're going to be kind of using some of these things for our uh, support services, but this recording will become available so you can follow along and slow it down. And um, if you have more questions, always feel free to reach out to us, but these will be posted on the COS site soon. Wonderful. Well, that's really nice. Um, okay. Well, if you do have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, otherwise, I'm going to close out the meeting. Uh, it does look like 85% of the people have filled out this exit poll. I appreciate every single one of you for doing that. Um, and with that, I'm going to hang out here until the top of the hour. Uh, but if you do have questions, please let us know.